Mark 13, starting at verse 1. And as he, that is Jesus, came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to them, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, but these are but the beginning of birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils and you'll be beaten in synagogues and you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when, you bring, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand about what you're to say, but, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And all of you will be hated for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the, the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as, as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being could be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then, if anyone says to you, look, there is the Christ, or look, here he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all these things beforehand." But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as it it branches, puts out branches and becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things will take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. It's kind of an odd uh, chapter that we've just read together, and that's why I wanted to attack it all in one, one go. Mark 13. It's famous um, for being odd and difficult. Uh, it's a huge text, and it really deals with this concept, I suppose we could call it the end of the world or the end of the age or something like that. And so uh, when we read it, and um, uh, we'll just be getting into some, some of the issues today, uh, there's three things that I think just come to the surface when we, when we study it. And I want to impress those upon us this morning. The first, number one, is that God is sovereign. The second thing it shows us is that Jesus is coming. And the third thing it shows us is that we have a mission. God is sovereign. Jesus is coming. We have a mission. So, God is sovereign, first of all. Amen. Praise God that he is sovereign. Um, at such a time as this, we need to know that. Um, this is a, probably a collection of, of various writer, uh, sayings of Jesus, 
uh, that Mark has, has brought together in, in this um, passage, um, all dealing with this concept of the end of the world. And uh, the context, as we've been seeing over the last sort of six weeks or so, has been Jesus coming into the temple. Remember, he came in on the donkey, sort of official arrival. Um, it was a bit of an anticlimax. And then he started to, um, pr- I suppose, in some ways, pronounce judgment on the temple, much like the fig tree that we saw at the start. Uh, Jesus says it's all full of life, or sorry, full of, full of, uh, um, full of, uh, full of show, but no life. You know, it's, it's all for show, but there's no heart in it. And much like he cursed the fig tree and it withered away, uh, so too Jesus was sort of uh, judging and dispensing with the temple. It's no longer fit for purpose. Uh, some people think that this is one of the most difficult sections in the whole New Testament. Um, I certainly think it is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, to understand and to piece together. So before we actually get into some of the bits and bobs that we're going to cover, I want to just try and uh, give us some interpretive skills uh, to help us locate what's going on in in this whole thing we've just read together. And what we have here, uh, as as you probably guessed, is is Jesus giving a prophetic uh, pronouncement of future events yet to take place uh, from his time. And uh, rather like looking at a mountain range, you know, so if you go to Newcastle, for example, and you look up and you can just see uh, the sleeve donuts, you know, in front of you, um, what, 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 what it's uh, not so easy to see is there are multiple peaks in between you and the top of the sleeve donuts. And, and so in some ways, that's, that's what we're seeing here with Jesus. He, he is looking ahead. He's pointing our, our, our eyes away into the future. Uh, but there are, there are multiple peaks um, that, that we are going to come across uh, near and far. And, and if you've ever climbed up a, a large hill, like a sleeve donut, you, you, you sort of, uh, from, from the car park, you think, ah, oh, great, it's just up there. But actually, when, when you start going an hour into it, you realize that just up there is actually a lot further away than you thought, and you've just reached a bit of a peak, but there's more to come, and you have to keep on pressing forward. So we're seeing something like that throughout this whole chapter here, peaks near and peaks further away. The near peak we could say, is all about the destruction of the temple. We'll think about that in a minute. And the furthest away peak is the destruction of the present age. And these two things are sort of interwoven in what Jesus is saying here in Mark 13. So that's the, the sort of like the, uh, the framework that we're going to use as we go through uh, and think about this together. Uh, so first of all, what's happening here? Well, Jesus is, you know, literally and sort of metaphorically leaving the temple behind in verse 1. And then a disciple, we don't know the name of the disciple, sort of flags it up and says to Jesus, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And indeed, they were wonderful. They were enormous. Uh, contemporary historian at the t- you know, around the time of Jesus, just after Jesus, said that some of the stones that were used in the construction of the, the temple walls were up to 60 feet in length. Huge, huge, hundreds and probably thousands of tons in weight per stone. Um, even, even more recently, archaeologists have found uh, towards the north of Jerusalem, stones are at least 45 feet in, you know, today in existence. The rest were probably smashed to pieces. According to Josephus, it took three people with touching fingertips to encircle some of the columns that were in uh, the, the central places within the temple. So vast and, and wide with the diameter of these magnificent columns holding up um, various floors above them. The temple area itself uh, was about 12 football fields in its area. So it's huge. Uh, and, and it's such a great testimony to, to the heritage of the Jewish people, uh, the history of the Jewish people, their religion. And Jesus says in verse 2, do you see all these great buildings? He says, they're going to be knocked to pieces. There's not one stone that you can currently see that will be left on top of another one. They will be smashed apart. Because this temple, he says, is all show and it's no life, much like the fig tree. And so then this sets up the question from these disciples, well then, if that's the case, then how do we know this is going to happen and when is it going to happen? You know, what, what's the timing of these things and what is the sign that these things are about to take place. And so then we get that in verses 5 through 13. These things will come about um, before the destruction of the temple. Uh, Jesus says that the deception is going to increase. He says, look, many are going to come in my name and seek to lead people astray. They're going to come with their religious talk. 
and their teachings, and they will try and lead people astray, pretending to be the Messiah. He, he goes on and say, but there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be natural disasters such as earthquakes and famines. All of these things are happening around you. That's one of the signs you know this is on its way. But not only that, there are things that will be happening to you as well as things that are happening around you. In verse 9, he says, Many of you will be handed over to authorities. You'll be beaten. You'll stand trial. You'll be persecuted for my name's sake. Even your nearest and dearest relationships, relatives, friends, children, they will turn against you. They'll dob you in. They will sell you out. You'll be hated for my name, says Jesus in verse 13. And all of these things will happen in the run-up to that first peak, that temple, getting smashed to pieces. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Jesus is effectively saying to his disciples at that time, I'm telling you this now so that you're ready for when it happens. So that you'll know that God is sovereign. I've already told you what's going to take place. You can be ready for it. You won't think that this is happening outside of God's control. God is telling you. He says, much like the fig tree, we see that again in verses 28 to 31. When the fig tree sprouts its leaves and puts out branches, we all know, says Jesus, that summer's on its way. This is what happens. You know, I was out walking with Eliza just after Christmas, and I even saw just then some little buds on a magnolia tree or something as we were walking along, and I tried to get her excited and say, isn't this great? And she, she wasn't that bothered. But anyway, I was, because I just thought, great, you know, spring is coming. It's the, we know when we look at these signs that something lays ahead. And Jesus says, well, I've given you these signs. And much like the fig tree, now you know that these things are coming. You know what to look for. You know the end is near. But through all this, God is sovereign. We see this throughout the the entire text. And and I would recommend you go home and read it again and and just check what what I'm saying to you. But God is sovereign. uh, And we see that throughout. And God God is He's not just looking on from outside as some sort of bystander, wondering what these human beings are doing. God, God is not like that. That's not how he interacts with us. He, he, he uh, is over it all. He governs human history. That's why Jesus can say in verse 7, when you hear of all this stuff taking place, don't be alarmed. This is not the end. All this is happening, but it doesn't mean you're going to be finished. It's all part of God's plan. And uh, history shows us that Jesus was right. Jesus was probably prophesying these things around A.D. 30. And things took place as he predicted. For example, one uh, Roman emperor called Caligula, around the time of Jesus, sought to erect a statue of himself in the Jerusalem temple so that the Jews would worship him as God. He sought to do that. He didn't actually get to do it. He was thwarted. But when this happened and when word got out, there were rumors of an uprising of the people of Israel against Rome. It never materialized. Actually, there was a real war about 20 or so years after that. The zealot revolt brought the wrath of Rome squarely upon Palestine. In between whilst there were famines, such as through the reign of Emperor Claudius. There were earthquakes in Phrygia and Pompeii. There was a civil war. And finally, the temple itself was destroyed in AD 70 under the leadership of a Roman general called Titus. It happened just as Jesus said it would. God is sovereign. Heaven and earth may pass away, says Jesus, but my words will never pass away. And he was bang on. Most of what we read here in this section is referring to the destruction of the temple, and we saw that in AD 70, many, many years ago. But much of what Jesus is saying here is applicable in any age. Uh, today, of course, we are, we are so aware uh, of wars and rumors of wars. Even this week, we saw a Russian tank firing into a Ukrainian uh, nuclear plant. Wars and rumors of wars. Over one million refugees and counting have fled Ukraine to seek refuge in neighboring countries. There are threats between East and West. There are counter threats. And with globalization and capitalism, we all will feel the effects of what is happening in that part of the world. 
And that's not to mention, you know, it's been uh, knocked down the, 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 the list, I suppose, but that's not to mention the global pandemic from COVID-19 and other things like climate change leading to flooding and various forms of destruction across the world. All this stuff is going on. And yet through this, we can see that God is sovereign. He's got this. Uh, it's not out of his control. None of this is out of his control. These wars will not end us. Nations will rise up against one another, and that's not how it will end. Kingdoms and earthquakes and famines will happen, and that's not how this stuff will end. These are signs that the world is broken, that we're under a curse. This is the effect of our sinfulness. But it doesn't mean that God is absent or in any way powerless. But it does mean that these threats, these, these world events, when they happen, we can look at them and know that they don't own us. They don't dictate how it will end up. God does. It doesn't mean like it's going to be like this forever. But Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. What he's saying is his words are far more reliable than the most magnificent structures that any of us can build. Much more important than any conspiracy theory you might read online. Much more influential than any rumors you may hear, any news you might read, any statistics you might come across. His word remains true. And in fact, if that's the case, then there is something of the next world already present right now through the words of Jesus. God is sovereign. It's a message we need to hear this morning. But the second thing this text shows us, again, big picture, Jesus is coming. Remember we were talking about earlier about these two peaks that you look at, and Jesus is sort of uh, you know, pointing our, our, our view to both of them. One behind another. We've got the near peak, you know, which he deals with the destruction of the temple. And we see that actually took place today. And, and the effects of that are still present, right? There is no temple. There is no sacrifices anymore. It's still destroyed. The, the word that Jesus spoke in AD 30 still stands today. But, but all this interlocks in this passage we just read with, with the far picture. You know, what's going on further into the future? And what we see there is Jesus is coming. The temple has fallen but unfortunately, there is worse yet to come. It's a very bleak picture. We see this in verses 14 through to 23. And, and, and really at the forefront of this, this uh, far worse uh, suffering and struggle and trials to come is this figure that Jesus identifies as the abomination of desolation in verse 14. This is somebody or something or some situation that comes, some scandalous act that happens that seems to then kickstart this immense what the Bible says in verse 19, tribulation. It's immense suffering and affliction and distress. Who or what is the abomination of desolation? Not a phrase that we would use very commonly today. What is it or what have you? Well, we can tell it's most likely a person because Jesus says in verse 14, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, Sounds like it's a, a person, probably a he. It's a person to come. And Jesus identifies this individual as the abomination of desolation. That, by the way, is not something that Jesus has made up himself. Uh, that's, that's a theme that has been developed um, already by the Hebrew prophets, particularly uh, the book of Daniel. So if you go back and read Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter 9, 11, and 12, you'll hear reference and see reference to the abomination of desolation. So that's what Jesus gets it from. And Jesus is taking what Daniel has, has seen many hundreds of years earlier, and he is projecting uh, further forward, and he's saying to his followers and to his people, that stuff that Daniel was talking about is yet to take place. This character, this figure, has yet to come about. It's kind of an old school word, abomination. It really just means uh, pollution, uh, making something filthy that was previously right or clean. That's the effect of this individual. And desolation, you know, it means de devastation, destruction, all right? So, so this person is going to come and bring uh, such pollution, such vile uh, actions or whatever it happens to be, that that which was previously holy is going to be made effectively unholy. It's going to be devastated. Jesus does not give us any further details about this person and what that will look like. 
But effectively, I think it's somebody who will ultimately uh, substitute themselves for God. Standing, it says, where he ought not to be. Somebody will come along who will require absolute worship, absolute praise, absolute honour, on pain of death, if you do not provide that. That's why Jesus recommends that when this happens and when you see these things happening in verses 14 through 18, flee, get out. Don't even turn back and pack a bag. Go. And during these days, Jesus says in verse 19, there'll be such tribulation, such suffering that has not been seen from the creation, the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. It's terrifying. Whatever he sees, it's terrifying. And as we've already seen, there's a... Uh, kind of on steroids, there'll be a prolifer- proliferation of deception. It says in verse 22, false Christs and false prophets will attempt to lead the faithful astray. You know, we've seen this already, haven't we, you know, through our, our studies, through um, you know, fake religion and what Jesus was dealing with in the temple. Well, you take that and you, you magnify it a thousand times. That's what we're seeing here. Someone using religious language, someone fooling many, some convincing many to worship him. He evidently has power to be able to perform signs and wonders. Who is this person? Specifically, we have no idea. The scripture doesn't teach us. Some uh, historians and scholars think it was Emperor Caligula himself who sought to set up a, a statue to his own praise and worship in the temple. But it can't have been him because he actually failed to do it. He, he didn't pull it off. Others think it was the great general Titus who led the invasion of Jerusalem, destroyed it, and entered the temple. But during that time, no one fled Jerusalem. Not to the extent we're talking about here. In fact, if they had fled, they would have died because the Roman uh, armies were surrounding Jerusalem under siege. The, 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 The details do not fit the historic record. Most likely then, this figure here that Jesus identifies as the abomination of desolation is identified elsewhere in the New Testament by different names. The Apostle Paul, for example, uh, writes to the church in Thessalonica and he, he refers to the man of lawlessness, this individual that will appear at the end times with all power and able to, provide, uh, to do false signs and wonders. The Apostle John in Revelation 13 refers to a character called the Beast. Um, with an ability to deceive many people, again, with great power, an ability to do signs and wonders, to fool others into following him. It seems to be taken together, the abomination of desolation as a future figure that we are yet to see, representing the second peak of Jesus' prophecy in Mark 13. This is terrifying. This is very fearsome. But Jesus says these things to us to say, fear not. Why? Because Jesus is coming. We see that in verses 24 to 27. Jesus says, in those days, when that period of tribulation is over, he says, the sun will go dark, the moon will fade, the stars will fall from heaven, the heavens themselves will be shaking, and you will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Again, drawing on uh, some of the things that we see in the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 7. This son of man coming in, in power and great glory. And, and Daniel sees with a little more sort of uh, detail, I suppose, he's given dominion, he's given glory. He, all the nations will come and worship the son of man when he comes in power. His kingdom is everlasting. It shall never pass away. It shall never be destroyed. So what we're saying here and what we're seeing in these, these verses is that no matter how ferocious this abomination of desolation or man of lawlessness or beast or whatever you want to call it, no matter how ferocious, how blasphemous, how deceptive, how tyrannical that individual is and his effect on the whole world, Jesus is coming. And when he comes, it says he's going to send his angels to gather his people, the elect, that is the church across all the world, all of heaven and earth, and he's going to gather them to himself. Whether they're alive or in the grave, Jesus will gather his people to himself. The many come to the one. So if you are a believer in Jesus, if you have what we can understand as saving faith in Jesus Christ, then one day Jesus will gather you. You might be alive at the time, you might be in the grave at the time, but either way, he will call your name. 
and you will answer. He won't leave anyone out. All of his people will hear his voice no matter where they are and what they've done. If they trust him, they will be gathered to him to rule and reign with him in the new heavens and the new earth. You have nothing to fear. If you're not a believer, however, um, (laughs) you're probably listening to all this and it it just sounds really odd, doesn't it? Um, It does sound very uh, sci-fi, very farcical. Hardly the sort of thing uh, that you want to build rational religious beliefs on. And yes, we, we agree. I agree. It is odd. Uh, we are dealing with some very bizarre imagery. To be honest, there is more bizarre bits of the Bible than this, but you have a point. But the point here is that, that Jesus is, is, is uh, teaching us and showing us about something beyond our current reality, beyond our current experiences. And so as such, it's always going to sound odd, isn't it, when we're, when we're appearing so far in the future. But remember, what we're dealing with here are the words of Jesus of Nazareth. We're not dealing with the words that come from some American Christian fundamentalist novels or from the last Star Trek movie. We're dealing with the words of Jesus. And what Jesus is doing here is drawing on this long-established literary tradition from the Hebrew Bible. The, 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 the Jewish prophets uh, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, um, spoke very widely about the day of the Lord, this, this, this idea of the day of the Lord, this cataclysmic event when, when the sun switches off, you know, the stars fall out of the sky, and God comes to earth in power. And he wipes away all of his enemies, and he, and he brings the fullness of his kingdom. That was called the day of the Lord. And you can see bits of this reflected in Ezekiel, or Isaiah, or Daniel, or Zechariah, or Joel, and others there. And all this stuff that Jesus is talking about is there in the Hebrew prophets in some form or other. But understandably, that's not our heritage as Western people. Uh, we, We don't think necessarily in these terms. We have different ways of telling stories that shape us and our beliefs. But you know know this when you go on holiday to a a country that's not your own or to a culture that's not your own. In order to understand a new culture, you have to step into it and try and understand it on its own terms. And that works in human interaction. It works in literature. Um, In order to understand it, we have to step into it and, and listen to it on its own terms. And so here, too, is what we need to do. Uh, We need to listen to this on Jesus' own terms. This is Jesus' prophetic representation of all of human history. And yet he's using specific Hebrew ideas. So yes, of course, it's odd to our ears. Uh, But the more we step into the language of of the Bible, the more we start to understand uh, where he's coming from. But either way, I think we get the idea of what he's he's saying here. But that's Jesus' version um, of of the the big picture of human history. But what what would you say is your version if you have a version, how, how do you think things are going to end? Um, some of us opt for the idea of reincarnation. You know, that, that, that there is no real end. It's just that we sort of die and become reincarnated and reborn and just like a cycle, come back again as some other creature, um, some, some such. Many people, uh, I think probably many more in our own society, just think that death on death you just cease to exist. You know, you, you, you are no more. There's no more soul. There's nothing that goes beyond the grave. You just go back into the ground and that's it. So either, you know, we're, we're, we're stuck in an endless cycle of reincarnation or we just simply cease to exist. And I would say that neither option gives us much hope for the future. It certainly doesn't give us much meaning for the present. One... Um, famous Christian leader, recently said, what you believe about the future dictates very strongly how you live in the present. So what do you believe about the future? How do you think it's going to end? Because that will impact how you live now and how you treat other people. And if Jesus' teaching is to be believed, here he says he will come again, he will make all things new, and as such he gives us great hope. He gives us this vision of, of restoration. And that has a big impact now on how we live and how we treat one another and what we do with our money, what we do with our time. 
I think Jesus' worth, words are worth listening to here. Because after all, he did rise from the dead. And that gives him a certain qualification that I think none of us will have. So we've seen God as sovereign. Secondly, we've seen Jesus is coming. And thirdly and finally, therefore, we have a mission. We have a mission. These two peaks that we've been talking about, the first has already occurred in AD 70. The the temple was destroyed. But the second is yet to come. And the fact that the first one happened, according to Jesus' prophetic words, it strengthens our understanding that the second one is sure to happen too. And so as such, we're sort of in between those two peaks, you know. Uh, The first has already happened. We're waiting for the second one. So the question we're going to ask ourselves as we finish is, how do we live between those two peaks? Um, what, what are we to do as we await and press in and trust? Well, in the text, there are multiple teachings. Um, and in fact, if you go back and read again, you'll realize that Jesus could not have been much clearer when it came to his big teaching, his big encouragement, his big warning to his people. And it's twofold. Number one, Jesus says, stay awake. And number two, he says, stay on mission. Stay awake. Stay on mission. And to demonstrate that, Jesus told us many parable towards the end of, there of, of the text. What the disciples are to do in verses 34 to 37. Um, we don't know when this second peak is going to happen, but Jesus says, here's how you should live. And he gives a story, a parable. He says, a man, you know, the master of the house, going on a journey... And before he left, he put his servants in charge, each with his own work. And he said to the doorkeeper, keep watch, stay awake. That's your job. Be on the lookout. That's your only job as the doorkeeper. Keep watch. Do not fall asleep. Who knows when the master is going to come back? He says again in verse 36, do not fall asleep. He says in verse 37, I say what I say to you, I say to all. That's you here, right now, sitting here. Stay awake. So how are we to live? Be ready. Be expectant. Be on guard. Be on mission. Do what I've told you to do, says Jesus. Don't fall asleep. Don't nod off. Don't wander away. Don't drift. This is how you should live. What then is our mission? Jesus has given all these jobs to his servants. What then is our mission? It should not come as a surprise to you by now because we've been seeing it from the beginning of Mark's gospel up until now. The mission that God puts the disciples of Jesus on is to show and tell the kingdom of God. Or in other words, it's to preach the gospel, as it says in verse 10, to all nations and to live it out. Or in other words, as Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel, go and make disciples of all nations. That's our mission. That's what you're to do. And we can see how that comes to being, particularly in the context of the church here in verses 9 through 13. As we've seen already, Jesus says, many of you will be put on trial for your faith. Many of you will be brought before governors and authorities, whether they're secular authorities or religious authorities. But he says, when that happens, you will have unprecedented access to preach and witness to Jesus. That's how we understand verse 10. The gospel must first of all be proclaimed to all nations. That's how it happened at the start of the church. We see that all through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a commentary on verse 10. And when we open the book of Acts, and we we, we studied it carefully as a church a few years ago, we see the apostles and leaders quite often of the church on trial for their faith. You know, we saw Stephen and Peter and John, all of them appearing before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. We saw Philip getting an opportunity to speak to this high-ranking civil servant from Ethiopia. We see Paul interacting with the center of uh, intellectual excellence in the Areopagus in Athens, in Greece. We see different Christian leaders being brought before the Roman governors, whether that be Pilate or Felix or Festus or Publius of Malta or Sergius Paulus of Cyprus, the Herods, and even Caesar himself eventually in Rome. All of these individuals, these high-ranking people, 
heard the gospel of Jesus, saw the kingdom of God take place right in front of them. And so the gospel in that first generation was preached to all nations. And yet it came by way of persecution and suffering. And it's through the tribulation that God grew the church. It's amazing how many times we see that mission and persecution often come hand in hand. I think it's safe to say that's how you know if the gospel is advancing with power when you likewise see opposition and suffering rising up. It's never far away. So why was Jesus so adamant, so clear? Stay awake. Stay on your guard. Why was he so clear about that? Well, he knows that we're prone to drifting off, wandering away. He knows that if we're not on guard, we will be easily swayed by false Christs and false prophets. And if this is to be believed, the big one is yet to come. I think it's safe to say that in general, one of the biggest problems with the church, especially us in the affluent West, is that many of us are asleep. You know, we're comfortable, entitled, so risk-free Christianity. It's never been tested. We've never been on trial. We've just received all this. And quite often we, we look at our heritage and we look at our wealth and our culture and our lack of persecution, unlike the majority church outside of the West. And we're more like this disciple in verse 2. And we remind ourselves and encourage each other and say, look at these wonderful buildings. Look at these wonderful stones. Aren't they magnificent? <sighs> Good on us. And as the, the church in general, we place so much pride in in our history, and where we've come from, and our doctrines, and our structures. And yet Jesus says to his church right now, wake up. Many of us have switched off. That's why the West, the church rather in the West is shrinking, because we've fallen asleep. That's why Ireland is the least evangelized English-speaking country in the world. That's not something to be proud of. That's why the social markers of secularism have been accepted on this island with such ease, such as abortion or same-sex marriage. Because the church has been asleep. In closing, then, let's ask ourselves, as a church, how then should we live? Let's listen to Jesus' warnings here. Stay awake, stay on mission. How should we do that? Stay awake, firstly. And then allow me to speak directly to you this morning. Jesus speaks directly to us, so I'm just repeating what he said. If you only think that God or faith is something you do on a Sunday, and yet it does not concern you or influence you throughout the week, then you have a serious problem. You know, the sort of religion that we see here, you know, the sort of religion that's just the done thing or the, the family tradition where you just go because you've always gone, that kind of religion is rapidly dying away. It is in my home country and uh, it's heading in that direction here too. We're just a few years behind. Stay awake. Wake up and know what you believe and why you believe it. You and I both know that, that if, if you were driving in your car and you started to fall asleep, you would take immediate action because the risks of you doing nothing could be catastrophic. Okay, you would stop. You should stop. You would take a rest. You need to phone someone else to, to come and help you or, or, or swap with the, someone else in the car if there's someone there to do the driving. You would take a coffee, wind the windows down, put the radio on. 
We know that we should take immediate action if we fall asleep in the car. If you fall asleep in your faith in Jesus, then you are required to take immediate action. Wake up. Park whatever it is you're doing and do whatever it takes for you to know God, to to actually know God. The Apostle Paul writes in one of his letters, examine yourselves, he's writing to the church, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Because he knows there are plenty of people who go to church, but they're not actually in the faith. Examine yourself. Take a good hard look at yourself. Are you in the faith? And do whatever it takes for you to be confronted by the word of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to stand here and give you a list of things you should go off and do. I'm not going to be prescriptive. I know it's different for every person. But whatever it looks like for you, it must lean on the means of grace. It's going to involve the Bible. It's going to involve prayer. It's going to involve worship. It's going to involve the supper, the bread and the wine. It's going to involve community, seeking the Lord while he may be found. These means of grace are like spiritual smelling salts, jolting you back to life. Do whatever it takes. Stay awake. Number two, stay on mission. Make disciples. Proclaim the gospel in word and with deed, evangelize, baptize, disciple. That is what we do here at Foundation. That is what the church does. It's the team that does that. We do it together. It's us, it's you. So all this stuff about mission, making disciples, baptizing, evangelizing, that's not just for one or two keen beans. The rest of us could just chill. Neither is it for the paid staff. This is our job as a community on mission to make disciples. If only just a few of us do that, then the body is deformed. We will limp. We will be fighting with one hand and half a foot and an eye that's blind. That's what happens if you fall asleep. But yet when we pull together, if we all wake up, if we all receive the smelling salts of the word and the spirit, then we become strong, then we become effective. So as we finish, let me ask you, are you on mission? Are you part of the community that makes disciples? God is sovereign. Jesus is coming. And we are on mission. A couple of ways you could possibly respond to that this morning. How do we do that? How do we be on mission? Well, you've you've, you've heard me talk a few times now about the Alpha course that's coming up. Why don't you do the Alpha course? Or better still, why don't you bring people with you? Um... Why don't you share on social media or send a text or even speak to someone at work this week and invite them? You know, it's based on your friendship with them already. You, you do have friends, don't you? Well, ask them to come. God gives you friends for a reason. Another way you can do it is join the church and enter the ministry here. Whether that's serving in kids, catering, crash, sound, tech, evangelism, welcome team, set up, set down. It's not as if you've got no options here. There's plenty of options. Are you on mission? Join the community. Stay awake. Stay on mission. Jesus is coming. Let's pray.